Laurie Cardoza Moore, and this is Focus on Israel. Hello and thank you for joining me today on Focus on Israel. My name is Lori Cardoza Moore, a wife and proud mother of five wonderful children. Like most Americans, I began to ask a lot of questions about what happened to our country following 9-11. As I read and talked to experts, the issues of radical Islam and the attacks on America and Israel became extremely personal to me. In response, I founded Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and sharing the message of Christian biblical responsibility to the people and land of Israel against the rise of a new anti-Semitism. In this series, Focus on Israel, I wanted to share with you what I've learned through my research and meetings with experts in their respective fields. The mission of this series and PJTN is to educate and equip you so that you can share this information with your family and friends. We'll present information you'll not see in the mainstream media. With your financial support, we can reach Christians around the world with our message to stand against the growing threat of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel propaganda. After studying the scriptures, I realized that God had not forsaken his covenant with his people, Israel. Unfortunately, there is a growing trend in Christianity to spread an age-old false doctrine and tradition called replacement theology. This heretical doctrine suggests that because the Jews denied Christ, the covenant promises given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants now belong to the church. That is why, during the Holocaust, many Christians turned a blind eye to the Nazi death camps. Many felt justified in their passive and active involvement because they believed the Jews were the Christ killers. For this reason, we must learn and spread the truth. It is so very important that at this critical time in history, we must turn our focus on Israel. Now, if you've missed any of our past programs, I highly recommend that you purchase the DVDs of our past programs. Every lesson covers a specific topic and contains a wealth of information. Plus, each one also features interviews with numerous experts, including theologians, rabbis, pastors, political leaders, historians, and prominent archeologists, many of them from Israel. Each program makes a great group study source to share with your family, friends, home group, or church. So please consider how you can make a difference and spread the word. Today we're going to be delving into what has been termed the promise and look into whether this promise is still in effect for the Jewish people. First though, we must begin by discussing exactly what the promise entails. The first time it is discussed in the scripture is in Genesis 12, where God clearly and straightforwardly promised Abraham three things, the land, the nation, and the blessing. God promised Abraham a land of his own, that he would be made into a great nation, and that he would be blessed. Unfortunately, many Christians have been taught that this is no longer in effect today, and others may simply lack biblical knowledge regarding the eternal nature of the promise. Some may ask why it matters if the blessing is still in effect. Actually, it matters a great deal to all of us because it's proof that God does indeed keep his word. If we see that God is keeping his word to his people Israel, the covenant he began 4,000 years ago with Abraham, we can rest in knowing he's faithful and will keep his covenant with us as well. In a world where integrity is too often lacking and many do not keep their word, we are comforted in knowing that our lives and our faith are secure in God who is the rock who never changes. 
As headlines of daily current events verify, the eyes of the world are more and more focused on the tiny nation called Israel. American presidents and world leaders have one by one attempted to solve the Middle East dilemma, but all have failed. The focus of the world on this very small strip of land defies all human logic, unless one goes to the ancient writings of the Bible for illumination and understanding. To begin our teaching, we're going to hear from two Jewish leaders who have a great understanding into the promise as given to the patriarchs. First up, on my recent visit to Israel, I had the opportunity to speak with Shai ben Tekoa, a Middle East historian and Torah scholar. Next is Rabbi Dr. Gerald Meister. He recently served the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the State of Israel as its advisor on Israel Christian Affairs. He is also a renowned lecturer in comparative Jewish Christian theology and has directed the inter-religious department of the World Zionist Organization, Jewish Agency for Israel. Both men gave me greater insight into the promise. The Five Books of Moses is read every year by the Jewish people in a weekly series. The first five books that we read uh, begin with 11 chapters out of 187. The first 11 chapters cover the creation, Adam, Noah, the Great Flood. It's about mankind in general. Starting with the 12th chapter, we meet the character of Abraham and the first thing that the Creator says to him, leave your country and go to a country that I will show you. And I will promise you a nation coming from you that will be a special nation. The book ends, the five books end with Moses, who is Abraham's great-grandson's great-grandson. 500 years later, after the entire saga of the patriarchs and the matriarchs and the slavery in Egypt, 500 years after the promise, Moses stands on the east bank of the Jordan River and looks over into the promised land. It's the completion of the promise. The five books of Moses is about the promise of this land to the Jewish people and their obligations to live by the commandments God gives them. That's Judaism. That's the history of the Jewish people trying to get back here over the last 1800 years. And now we're back. Those of us who believe that God continues to proclaim himself in history and that God has not written the last word see the state of Israel as the beginning of the redemption of our people. We say in our liturgy on the Sabbath and on holy days when we pray for the state of Israel, we say that Israel is the beginnings of the redemption. So that the state of Israel is not simply another political state as Chile or Argentina or Canada or Norway, but Israel has a unique role to play because it is in the process of the fulfillment of the promises contained in the covenant. Not every Jew subscribes to this theology or to this idea, but then again, not every Jew is pious, nor is every Christian or who calls himself a Christian a true believer. Those of us who I think are aware of political process and historical continuity know that God is always in history and that there are no random acts. God does not conduct the world by whimsy. What happens happens because God writes straight with crooked lines. And with the re-emergence of a Jewish sovereign entity, the first time in 2000 years, and the state of Israel becomes the central point of Jewish national existence, the ingathering of the exiles, the building of a state and infrastructure and society and economy and all of the trappings of a modern nation built on the ashes of the Shoah in a land that was neglected for 2,000 years without any real productivity of any sort, this becomes a rather formidable statement about what God intends for the people of his covenant and with the certitude that God does not repent of his promises. God's stated desire and plan is not a frivolous collection of pious maxims. It is a divine instruction. God's word is, after all, inerrant in the same way that God is infinite and there has to be an appreciation of the fact that those of us 
who believe in God, believe in his truthfulness and in his fidelity to his promise. Samuel told King Saul, God does not repent of his gifts. And we see that in the rebirth of the Jewish state in consonance with the promise of Israel's return to its ancient homeland and the opening of the eyes of the Gentiles and the greater awareness in Christian communities, especially in the United States, that they have a profound role to play in the next chapters in salvation history. Thank you for joining us on Focus on Israel. I hope you're enjoying our program and are inspired to get involved. I'll be speaking in several communities in Florida this July. We'll be discussing the indoctrination of our children through their textbooks and on college campuses across the state. So please join me for these important events. For more information, please go to pjtn.org. God bless you and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren and the state of Israel. So how do we know that God's covenant with Israel is still in effect? I'd like to discuss five major points that prove that God's word does not change and he does not falter in his promise to the Jewish people. Number one, God decreed it in his word repeatedly and many times he confirmed it with an oath. Number two, starting around 1900, Jews began to return to their homeland, the only nation in history that has ever done so. Number three, against all odds, Israel not only survives, but thrives. Number four, the everlasting covenant was established through a blood sacrifice from ancient times. It is known as the most powerful and binding pact that can be made. Number five, Yeshua is the embodiment of the covenant, the new covenant. So first, let's look at the scriptures that document God's covenant with Israel. The famous passage of Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, is where Yahweh first makes the promise. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Then in Genesis 17, Yahweh again comes to Abraham, reaffirming the promise to multiply him greatly and to make him a father of many nations. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. In these verses, God used the word everlasting twice, emphasizing that the promise of the covenant would be permanent and ongoing, that it would go on forever. We move through time to the writer of the Psalms as he records for us in detail the nature of Yahweh's ongoing intentions in regard to the promise he made to Israel. In chapter 105, verse 7, we see the sovereignty of God established as the ruler of the earth. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is identified as the God of all the earth. His identity is first clarified to establish that he does have the authority to back up the profound pronouncement he makes regarding Israel. The psalmist then goes on by saying, he remembers his covenant forever, the word he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. 
the psalmist takes care in giving the exact line of descent of the promise, starting with Abraham, then coming through his son Isaac, and then hit to his son Jacob and to his descendants. In this passage of scripture, very strong language is used. Everlasting, covenant, oath, swore, decree, commanded. The creator of the universe, the Lord God of Israel, leaves no room for confusion or ambiguity in regard to the everlasting nature of the promise he made to his people. In Jeremiah 31 verses 35 and 36, Yahweh speaks of his everlasting covenant with Israel as a nation. This is what the Lord says, He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. Again, we see the promise that Yahweh made to Israel expressed in the most powerful and absolute way possible, as he states that Israel's remaining a nation forever is just as sure and certain as the universe continuing to function. In addition, great care is taken to identify who it is, who is speaking, who is making this immutable, unchangeable claim. The Lord Almighty himself, the one who created and appointed the sun, moon, and stars to shine, and who stirs the seas so that the waves roar. He is the sovereign God who created the earth and it belongs to him. He sustains it by his presence as he watches over his word to perform it. God revealed to King David in 2 Samuel 7:16 that the covenant with the nation of Israel would be forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Once again, Yahweh's long-term plans for Israel are stated clearly and straightforwardly. As we step back for perspective to get an overview, we see the Bible provides an historical and prophetic account of God's love relationship with his people Israel over thousands of years. Not only is their past chronicled, but world events and current events in the Middle East are explained in light of scripture. As long ago, Israel's future was foretold through the prophets. If we look closely, we can see 16 major prophecies in the Bible regarding Israel and 13 have already been fulfilled. This is in itself proof of the accuracy of the Bible and it also proves God's faithfulness to keep his word to his people. In light of the great challenges and turmoil that Israel faces daily, many are skeptical in the regard to the status and future of well-being of the country. Yet based on the past historical record of prophecies about Israel coming to pass, one would conclude that the promise is still in effect. Speaking to holy men and prophets over the course of many years, he caused his oaths and word toward Israel to be recorded 46 times regarding their inheritance of the land, and that is truly amazing. From the origin of the promise in Genesis 12 to the end of the book of Revelations, we see that Yahweh is absolutely committed to keeping his covenant with his people. Our second major point that proves that God's promise is the return of the Jews to their homeland. Starting around 1900, the last generations have had the honor of being eyewitnesses of prophecies coming to pass as Zionism began to be stirred deep in the hearts of those worldwide. History records the steady stream of the sons of Jacob returning from all the nations of the earth, returning to the homeland of their forefathers, just as the scripture foretold. Never before has such a thing happened where a nation returned to its birthplace after almost 2,000 years. Neither has a nation returned to its original language as the Jews have re-embraced their Hebrew language. As Isaiah the prophet saw the ingathering of the Jews to their homeland in chapter 11 and verse 12, he said of Yahweh, He will set up a banner for the nations, 
and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. In this prophetic hour in which we live, the Lord God of all the earth is raising up a sign, a banner for the nations that he is a covenant keeping God, that he is faithful. Although it has been 4,000 years since he made the promise to Father Abraham, he remembers his covenant and watches over his word to perform it as we are all witnesses. For all who will receive it, this banner is a banner of hope, comfort, and strength. Whether we are of the natural branches or of those grafted in, let us take heart in knowing that the Lord God of Israel is a covenant-keeping God. Our third point shows that against all odds, Israel not only survives, but thrives. Yet another sign that the promise is still in effect is that Israel is still here that she continues to exist in spite of impossible odds against her. She has been attacked again and again by armies that greatly outnumber her, yet she continues to not only survive, but to thrive. Any serious student of history and the wars surrounding Israel since 1948 would have to admit it would seem that there has been supernatural intervention on her behalf. Number four the covenant ratified by blood. The promise, the everlasting covenant, started as a scarlet thread in the heart of our Abba before the foundations of the world, as the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth. The foreshadowing of the covenant was revealed first to Adam and Eve as blood was shed in order to cover them with tunics after their sin. God's covenant was revealed to Noah as he was kept through the 40 days and nights of rain. In celebration of Abba's faithfulness, after he came out of the ark, he offered up blood sacrifices and Abba gave him the rainbow as a sign of his covenant. When Abba Father came to Abram in Genesis 15, we see that he cut covenant with him through the shedding of blood. Amazingly, God himself entered into a pact an eternal agreement with Abram. Because Yahweh knew that Abram in his humanity would fail, he put Abram to sleep and made the covenant with himself by standing in on Abram's behalf as the burning torch that passed through the blood sacrifices. Because Yahweh stood in on Abram's behalf, the covenant cannot fail nor can it be broken because it relies on God rather than on man in his frailty. It is the scarlet thread that came down through Moses and the children of Israel as they took hyssop and painted the lamb's blood on the doorposts of their homes during Passover as they celebrated their liberation from Egypt. It is the scarlet thread that Rahab tied to her window on the Jericho wall as she witnessed the miracles of the Lord God of Israel as he showed himself faithful to give his people their covenant land. And finally, the promise is not only still in effect, it is made new as revealed to Jeremiah in chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Many years later, the disciple Matthew records for us the new covenant, as our Messiah was on his way to becoming the one-time Passover lamb. Just before his death, as he was eating with his disciples, He said this to them, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which I shed for many for the remission of sins. As the writer of Hebrews states, the blood covenant was fulfilled through the the Passover lamb, Yeshua, and it is an everlasting covenant. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Yeshua from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete. We as Gentile believers become part of the commonwealth of Israel as we by faith partake of the Lamb, Messiah, and thereby become covenant people. We know that our heavenly Abba long ago asked Father Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham had bound him to the altar and was preparing to slay him when God intervened, knowing Abraham's heart of obedience and trust. Abba provided the ram in the thicket for a sacrifice, but our heavenly Abba was not able to spare his only son, Yeshua, in order that the eternal covenant could be ratified. He had to allow him to atone for the sins of all mankind. And in Galatians, Yeshua said, Yes, I will become the embodiment of love to break every yoke and barrier. Yes, I will give my blood to open the doorway for all who would forever call upon my name. I will become a curse to offer redemption from the law, that the blessing of Abraham might be received, the promise of the Spirit through faith. I wish we had more time to discuss this, but I'm afraid that's our show for today. I want you to know we appreciate hearing from you, so please send us your comments and questions to comments at pjtn.org. The time to stand up is now. Be a leader in your community and in your church. One person can make a difference. Get involved with and support pro-Israel organizations such as PJTN. Call your elected officials. Let your leaders hear from you. Visit our website to learn more. Sign up to receive free newsletters, action alerts, daily blogs, and order our films to share with family and friends. God bless you and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren and all Israel. We'll see you next time on Focus on Israel. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, P.O. Box 682711, Franklin, Tennessee, 37068. You can also support PJTN online. Visit pjtn.org or call 1-877-873-9020. Anti-Semitism has reached epic proportions and Israel is now surrounded by nations who seek its destruction. For Israel to lose just one battle would mean losing everything. As Christians, it is our biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren and Israel. PJTN needs your help to reach more Christians with this urgent message. Please visit our website to become a member today and order our award-winning documentaries. You must decide that you won't be silent. Sign up now at pjtn.org. God bless you and thank you for your support and prayers.